Welcome everyone to our online worship. Today, talking about change. Times of change can be exciting, challenging, resisted, embraced. One thing's for sure, we can't avoid times of change. And Jesus was never hesitant to confront people about making necessary changes in their lives if they wanted to truly understand what it meant to live as a follower. The same is true for us today. Yes, following Christ's way changes us. There's no doubt about that. But we always have a choice. We have a choice to continue on or back out. Today is Reformation Sunday. It was a time of massive change 500 years ago. And yet the Spirit is still calling us to discern the times and make the necessary changes, whatever is needed. A reading from the Gospel of John. The reading today is from the Gospel of John, chapter 8, beginning at verse 31. Then Jesus said to the Jews who had believed in him, If you continue in my word, you're truly my disciples. And you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. And they answered him, We are descendants of Abraham and have never been slaves to anyone. What do you mean by saying, You will be made free? And Jesus answered them, Very truly I tell you, Everyone who commits sin is a slave to sin. The slave does not have a permanent place in the household. The son has a place there forever. So, if the son makes you free, you will be free indeed. Today I'm going to be talking about making big changes, big changes in our lives. I think that uh, Reformation, this is Reformation Sunday by the way, and Reformation is all about making changes. Where change is needed, we move on it, we make the change, we lean into it, and we benefit from it. And uh, 500 odd years ago, Luther, Martin Luther, of course, looked at the church, what a mess it was in. And he bravely stood up against this massive, powerful institution and started to call out and name where the church, the leadership of the church, had gone completely off track. And, and as a result of his truth-telling, it was a massive, massive shift in Christianity about 500 years ago. And all sorts of wonderful changes came because someone was willing to look at a mess and name it and talk about it and things changed. So we're going to be looking at that today, not necessarily about church reformation because I'm really interested in personal reformation because it's not just big institutions that can be reformed like businesses or churches, uh, but s much smaller things can be reformed. Like for example, you can have, a, you can reform your marriage or your partnership you can uh, make changes and reform the way you look after yourself or think about yourself. You know, we all know how to make changes in order to make something better. And that really is at the heart of Reformation. Now, I won't surprise you to know that Jesus, of course, was the ultimate reformer. In fact, all the prophets were. Uh, in the Old Testament, Elijah and, and Jeremiah, and they all called for change, all of them, all the prophets. They all saw what was wrong with society or uh, people, or, uh, and, and they would call out for change and say, this isn't right, you're heading in the wrong direction. And of course, Jesus was exactly the same. And uh, he, his whole ministry, his whole focus was this, what, what we have come to know as transformational change on the inside, but in biblical terms, like in the New Testament terms, they would call it a change of heart. 
or they would call it a heart change in the Old Testament as well. But for the New Testament language, we talk a lot about heart change. What motivates us to do what we do? Because you see, if the heart, if the impulse, if, if what motivates us is moving in the right direction, it's going to affect all our behaviors, all the way that we interact with people, all the decisions we make. So I mean, it's like it's an in inside job, isn't it? So we start on the inside and then it's manifest on the outside. In fact, Jesus had a real thing about people pretending to be good, particularly religiously good on the outside and inside. They were just faking it. So today we have a passage and he actually, I think he's speaking to people who are faking it. So it's kind of a harsh passage. You know, it's always good to look at the context because if he's with people that he thinks are pretenders and they're faking it, he's, uh, he's, not all go he's not going to be all sweetness and light. He's going to nail it and he's going to be doing some truth telling. And that's what he does in this passage this morning from John. It's a conversation with people who say they follow Christ. They call themselves students, followers, as far as Jesus is concerned. They are not doing a very good job of following. They are failing miserably. Now, uh, remember for Jesus, how we live matters. How we live matters. Everybody can sound spiritual. Everybody can sound good or sound religious if one wanted to. Spiritual, I guess you might want to. Um, but for Jesus, it's not so much what you say. It's like, how are you living? How are you living? Because if your words don't match up with your behavior, that's when we get into the category of hypocrite, which is something that he was, let's just say he got very, very annoyed and used strong language to describe hypocrites. So here's the passage, John 8 verse 31. To the Jewish believers who had believed in him, he said, if you hold on to my teaching, you are my disciples. And the truth will set you free. So he's questioning their faithfulness. If you hold on, if you hold on to what I've been saying, if you practice it, then you are my students. And then what will happen is you're going to get set free. Your life's going to be changed. Here's the message translation. I like Eugene Peterson. He's always so clear. He says, same verse, 31. If you stick with this, living out what I tell you, you're my disciples for sure. And the truth will set you free. Now, there's something about their lives that is lacking a freedom, joy, spontaneity, all the things that freedom, the connotation of freedom, there's something wrong with these disciples. Uh, he's saying, no, you're not following me because if you were, I would see a difference in your life and I don't see any difference. Well, of course, the listeners, the receivers of this criticism get offended and they say, what do you mean set free? We are not anybody's slaves. What do you mean calling us? What do you, why are you saying? We're slaves. We're not free. We're free people. We're descendants of Abraham. We go back generations and generations. Nobody makes us slaves. And then Jesus counteracts and he says, you're a slave to sin. If the Son sets you free, you shall be free indeed. It's like, oh yeah, you're enslaved. You might not know it. You might not be aware of it but you are dominated by something. And it's not good and it's not God. Now remember, he's talking to a particular group of people. They're not seekers and they're not unbelievers. Actually, I think it's fair to say 
There isn't really such a thing as an unbeliever in the scripture. Uh, it, they didn't have that worldview. Today, you have people that say, well, I'm an atheist. Um, in that time, in that culture, 2000 years ago, there was, there was no concept of atheism. It was, you're either a believer and you're faithful and you're walking in the light or you're not faithful and you're doing your own thing. That was kind of the two choices in Jesus' day. So it was not so much, it's not really so much about believers and unbelievers. It's more about are you faithfully following or are you not faithful, faithfully following? This group, you're not faithful. And I can tell by your lifestyle, what you're doing, that you're not faithful. You're missing the mark. You're off target. Um, and I think it's fair to say, if our spiritual life, however we practice our spiritual lives, if it isn't helping you grow in grace and love and compassion toward yourself, and others in God, something's wrong. The three components are really, really important. Remember Jesus' three major teaching, learn how to love yourself, learn how to love other people, learn how to love God. Very, very important. A lot of people struggle with loving themselves. And of course, we've all struggled with loving other people, right? Do the first two and that third one's taken care of. So it's very, very easy for people to get off track and dominated, or Jesus' word, he liked a stronger word, enslaved. Jesus would say, you're enslaved to lots of things. And it's not God and it's not good. So, and when he's talking about being enslaved to something, he's talking about being influenced by something, or be led by something, being led by the wrong impulses. It's kind of like an addiction, really. You're led by unhelpful impulses. Actually, Luther, speaking at Reformation Sunday, Luther's a great example of someone who is absolutely enslaved to feeling guilty. Um, before he had this sort of major God encounter, he was one of these men that was addicted to feeling guilty. He was always feeling guilty, always felt like he would never measure up. He was never, ever good enough. He never, ever did it right. He was always trying and trying. And, and there's some kind of uh, interesting, unusual stories that apparently he would, he would like go to his um, superior monk and like for like 20 times a day would confess his wrongdoings which is way over the top, right? I mean, he's just plagued. No wonder he was troubled with depression. He was just plagued with guilt. And uh, apparently uh, his superior said to him one day, you know, just stop coming here. Stop confessing all your sins. Stop confessing all your mistakes. Just love and trust God. And Luther said, I can't love and trust God. I hate God. I hate God. And why did he hate God? Because he was always trying to please God and he always felt like a miserable failure. Yeah, I mean, some of us can relate to that, can't you? I mean, it was like trying to please a person and you're always criticized. You know, if you're, if you're trying to please someone and, and they're always criticizing you, there comes a point that you just quit trying, don't you? And it's like, what's the point? There's nothing I can do. It's never, ever going to be right. And it's getting near the end of a relationship when that happens, isn't it? So that was Luther, you know. He was, Jesus would say in Jesus' words, Luther, before he had this major sort of God encounter, aha moment, uh, Jesus would say, yeah, he's, he's, he's a slave to guilt. If the sun sets you free, you shall be free indeed. But that's an example of being absolutely dominated all your powers taken away and just guilt, guilt, guilt. Of course, you know the story that Luther did have an encounter with God and um, basically God impressed on him one of these epiphany moments. It's not about you, Martin. 
It's not about you. You are loved. And somehow the penny dropped. I mean, I'm sure he'd heard it a million times that he was loved, but you know, sometimes there's just the right time. It's just the right moment. And you know, you, you let it in and it's like, really? He said, it felt like I was born again. He said, it just felt like I was, like it was this new birth, like this whole new beginning. Well, it actually was a whole new beginning because he couldn't shut up about it, his experience, and it ended up um, starting the reformation of the church, which was a huge deal, which I won't go into today, but um, yeah, but the main thing was he, he just felt this freedom in his heart and his life and his spirit and it's, this is what Jesus is talking about when he says this line, when the sun sets you free, you'll know it. You will know it because there will be a lightness previously not experienced. Now, we might not be like Luther because guilt might not be our thing. You know, we might not have to struggle with feeling unworthy. Um, you know, we might have other things that dominate us. Maybe we're worried about the future. What, is, what if this happens? What if that happens? No, Jesus would say that is being enslaved, dominated by fear. We don't live that way. You're my disciples, you come and follow me. If the sun sets you free, you shall be free indeed. Um, or I might be stuck in the past with all sorts of unforgiveness. Well, no, Jesus would say, together we are going to, we're gonna let this go because I don't want you enslaved to that feeling of anger and resentment. Now, I'm not saying that this happens in a moment, because often it doesn't. But over time, just to, you know, over time to just be kind of gently looking at that every so often, allowing God's Spirit to come in and do what the Spirit needs to do, not resisting, things change. We change. Yeah, we can be dominated by all sorts of things, discouragement, melancholy, worry, anger, rage, envy, you name it, we, we, can, we can be dominated by it. And Jesus comes along and says, look, people cannot live without God. Now, I know I'm speaking to the choir, right? I'm speaking to the choir, but I think we, we can forget this. This is Jesus' whole teaching. People cannot live well without God. They're not made to be independent. They're not made to struggle through trying to fix everything alone. That's why Jesus says, if the Son sets you free, not if you work hard, you will be set free. No, he's saying no. This is, this is, a, this is a together project here. <laughs> This is God and us together. You know, take, take uh, my burden, Jesus said. My yoke is easy. My burden is light. We're in this together. I will help you with this. I'm the one that sets you free. You don't have to try and work out how you're going to free yourself. It's too hard. It's too much. It's too great. There's too much domination. There's too much enslavement. It's too big. It's just too big. We need the Spirit to come and do her work in us, changing us, transforming us, healing us. So much is healing, an awful lot of enslavement's healing. It's all about, well, a personal reformation, isn't it? Inner transformation. So it's good every so often, you know, when you hear these passages to just pause and think, okay, well, is there anything that, 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 that's stealing my freedom? And, and do I need to live like I'm loved? Have I sort of morphed into another way of living? Would it make a difference if I lived like I was completely, fu fully, 
utterly acceptable to God? Would that make a difference? Would that lighten the load in some way? If I, if I could just let that in just a little bit, that was absolutely, fully accepted and loved. It leads to freedom, Jesus teaches. Ultimately, that kind of knowing and that kind of living leads to freedom. So there's the heart cry and there's the prayer. God help us in any of the areas that we feel bound, that we feel tied, that we feel like we just can't break out of whatever it is. Come and set us free. I'm holding on to your promise. If the sun sets me free, I shall be free indeed. Amen.